Okay, I am now telling you that the maximum energy means that if I have, the first thing we need to agree on is that the X-rays coming out do not carry a single energy, meaning they are not monoenergetic, but polyenergetic. That's number one. If I set the voltage to 120 kV, then the highest energy that these photons will carry is 120. Now, from the spectrum I have, most of the photons coming out will have energy values equal to one-third of the maximum, meaning if we say 80 kV is the highest voltage I am using, then one-third of 80 is what? Most of the photons I have, specifically those that carry 20 kilovolts, are the ones I rely on in the process. However, I filter them using the filters I have. These filters remove certain photons, allowing me to obtain energy that is approximately at a specific level. In the world of radiation, there are two energy levels that are quite close to each other, around 20 kilovolts. This energy is what I use in the imaging process. So, I am not imaging at 120 or 100. I am imaging at a third of the maximum. And this is what I use in the imaging process. I hope people pay attention to this information. This curve represents the absorption process concerning different energies plotted on the x-axis at 20, 40, 60, 80, capturing the photon energy emitted from x-rays. On the y-axis, which represents the absorption measured in rads per ontogeny, we see the absorption that occurs based on the dose or the absorption that happens for the energies found at 20, 40 and these lower values, where you will find that the bone is approximately from the serum and more than the fat, yes, then the bone absorption decreased, 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 and then it equaled that of the serum and fat. Why? Because the absorption in the serum and fat is approximately equal to that in the low and high energy nerves. But the absorption present in the bone is high at low energy. Why? Because at low energy, you are dealing with how people return to their kidneys and remember what happens with low energies, which depends not only on that, but also on when it is high. The density of the bone is higher than that of the serum and higher than that of the fat. So it will depend on the fact that the photons will be supported by the... The energy of the photon will be fully transferred to the electron, resulting in high absorption from the bone at low energy, where you have the photoelectric effect. In high energy, or above the photoelectric range, you have the photoelectric effect and Compton scattering. However, Compton scattering is what occurs, and it involves the interaction of photons. When we look at Compton scattering, we see that a photon loses all its energy in the material, resulting in complete absorption. In Compton scattering, a scattered photon and an electron are produced demonstrating that the scattered photon can also be emitted from the patient itself, for instance. This is because it can carry energy that helps to produce scattered or noise, which is always the cause of image distortion or the interference present in the image. This occurs due to the presence of many scattered photons, which consequently creates a weak signal leading to distortion in the image and resulting in a noisy image. This next image clarifies the photon or energy. This is the effective energy that I mentioned, which reaches the maximum that I use. This is the X-ray tube and the primary radiation, which is the absorbed radiation, while the transmitted radiation is what passes through and the remnant radiation is what passes through and is the only one I receive on the detector and capture. Now, let's look at the CT generations or the generations of CT. The process of CT scanning or the discovery of CT or the operation of CT has not been like that and it hasn't gone away. This is the first image I got in just five minutes, meaning the first slice for the 60 today. You can now take images of the patient, a thousand slices, two thousand slices, as you wish. You can cut the brain and take cross sections of the brain, abdomen or chest, hundreds of images, each image with a slice, Depending on the devices and technology available now, let's look at the first devices. The green part is the X-ray tube, and the second part is the X-ray detector. 
In the past, they would tell you that I will use a thin beam X-ray tube and a single X-ray detector. They used to say, I will use a very thin X-ray tube, much thinner than the single one. The raw we saw in the other section was a line of detectors. If I only take one detector and use it to capture images, the efficiency will be very low. The detection efficiency for the photons will be very weak, and it will take a long time to cover 360 degrees around the slice. To cover and capture a single slice, it would take a very long time. And indeed, that's what was happening, because it was capturing only one slice, which would take about five minutes to produce. The great image we see. Five minutes to get this image. Five minutes to capture this slice. This was the first image of the 60. After five minutes, they decided to improve the process. Instead of using one detector, they would use a row of detectors, but the number of detectors wouldn't be large. They would use a row of about 30 detectors. Instead of using a fan beam, they would use a wide beam at certain angles to cover a larger area. So in one go, I could cover a large area of the patient's body. Then I would start because the idea is that I need to rotate around the slice to cover this section from all sides and eventually produce an image. Then I told you, the third generation, no. Make the beam larger, make the rotation larger. It can reach a number of 800 to 900 detectors and make the X-ray tube or the wide angle or make the fan beam larger. This is called the third generation. And this is what most devices operate on. Well, this is called the third generation, and this is basically what most devices are operating with. The third generation has a wider beam and can reach a number of detectors from 800 to 900. Now, regarding the use of the CT device, you might hear about the multi-slice CT, while the single slice device used to only have one row of detectors. Nowadays, you can have up to 320 rows of detectors, and there are devices with 640 rows of detectors. Each row covers a specific area of the patient's body, as if the rows of detectors are positioned under the patient. If I say I will use 10 rows of detectors and each row covers 5 millimeters, I can cover 50 millimeters in a single exposure, and so on. Thus, as the number of raw and the number of raw of detector decreases, the efficiency of the machine diminishes affecting its ability to perform detection and cover a large area in a short time. This is referred to as beam collimation. I can use a certain number of raw off detectors in my detection or imaging process. The fourth generation indicates that I will use a fixed ring of detectors while the X-ray tube moves around the patient's body. Using a fixed ring of detectors is very expensive to manufacture so it is not commonly used. Instead, they rely on the third generation. The fifth generation states that I will use four target anodes to create a very large beam, allowing it to cover a significant area in a short time. I utilize an electron Yipang gun to generate the beam and control it, directing it to the four target rings, resulting in a very large beam that can cover a vast area. The beam produced from one target is different from the beam produced from four targets, allowing me to capture images and um, cover a large area in a short time. This is the same shape as these four target anodes, and this is the, the electron gun. We can control its direction to focus on these four. After that, it is always used in heart imaging, specifically in imaging the heart of the patient so that I can capture images of the patient's heart. The step and shot technique involves adding one beam and efficiently imaging the heart with a thickness of 25 centimeters. I take a single image of this area and adjust the exposure instead of adding multiple beams and opening them around to cover all sections of the heart at once, I only add one beam. There is a technology called dual energy CT that uses dual source, meaning it utilizes two X-ray sources, each providing different energy levels. One source provides 80 kV and the other provides 140 kV. Then, 
a single detector is used to cover the area in less time, allowing you to have two spectra of energies. After that, you seem to be using dual energy source and dual detector, which reduces the time I will spend on the imaging process. This is number one. The image that will appear will allow me to create additional data, which we will discuss later. But I want to tell you that this technology exists and is called dual source, dual energy CT, or I can use one source, one detector. However, this one source moves 360 degrees around the patient, alternating between providing 80 kV and 140 kV. So I have the same idea with data at 80 kV and data at 140 kV, which is then used in the image reconstruction. 140 kV is used later in the CT scan for a specific purpose in image formation. I can either use one source but employ two types of detectors. One detector detects at 80 kV and the other at 120 kV. This effectively acts as if I have resolved the X-ray spectrum that is coming from it. By resolving the X-ray spectrum, I am able to enhance the quality of the diagnostic image. After that, the image reconstruction process takes place. Now let's talk about something very important. What is the goal of the CT scan? The goal is always to reduce the dose that the patient receives while maintaining image quality. There are two very important objectives that we must follow to achieve the lowest possible dose while providing a clear diagnostic image. A diagnostic image should provide a clear diagnostic view. The goal is not to create a smooth, beautiful and impressive image for the doctor. What matters is whether the diagnostic information is visible or not. This is the important goal without exposing the patient to unnecessary radiation doses, especially when the patient does not actually need a high dose. How is this done? A set of factors is controlled on the CT scan machine which manages and reduces the dose that the patient receives. There are several factors to consider, including the cauterization we discussed and the milliampere we also talked about, along with some other factors that we will touch upon. Additionally, there are some modern technologies that allow me to work on image formation using something called an algorithm. This algorithm can be used to address the noise present in the image, thus enabling me to achieve my goal with a lower dose. Furthermore, there is something called dose modulation techniques. We will discuss each of these in detail. But first, let's talk about patient dose calculation. I currently have an x-ray tube and I need to calculate the energy that has been absorbed by the patient lying in this position. In the eye, the energy that reached and was absorbed is not the same as what passed through. The latter cannot be considered absorbed. The exposure that was recorded is not what was absorbed. I want to know how much energy actually reached and was absorbed within the patient's body. So how can this be determined? I just want to shock you by saying that there is no way to tell you 100% that this is the dose for the eye. No device can tell you that this eye received a specific dose. It gives you a value, but that value is not 100% accurate. How the calculations that come out on this device happen is as follows. First, if I have a single section, I take this section and provide a profile for the dose. Always consider the height of the patient's body. This area is the highest point and the area that is close to the patient's head and the area that is after the center. This is referred to as the dose profile area. Your dose profile takes this shape. This is the center area, which is the central area. And this is the area of the extremities of your section. So this is the dose profile. Now. I want to calculate the dose within this section. How much dose has reached here? Let's go back. And assume I have this section. I take one slice of the patient's body. This slice is like a section. If I take 20 slices, that means a total of 20 slices. Now I want to calculate the dose for these 20 slices. What should I do? 
You should treat the patient's body as if it were a phantom, as if the patient's body were a phantom. This phantom is a water phantom. Since the human body is composed of 70% water, I'll choose a material similar to the human body that I can use in the dosimeter. I'll use a phantom made of water. If I obtain the dose in one section and perform integration of the dose. Regarding my dose, the dose of the group of sections that I have taken, I can reach what exactly? I have now obtained the dose in the section and performed integration for the group of sections based on their weights. Therefore, I will calculate something called the city dose index. The city dose index is the first term I will use in dose calculation. I will assume that I have a phantom with a group of sections. For each individual section, I performed integration for these sections based on their weights. So I have derived something called the city dose index. Now, how do I calculate the city dose index? This is calculated using a phantom. The medical physicist works on this phantom. As you can see, there is a hole here and there is a hole in the center, and there are holes in the peripheral areas, as well as holes at the top, bottom, right, and left. There are holes in the ionization chamber. Where should... I placed the abdominal part. I connected it to the monitor to measure the dose that will come to these parts. So, what will I do with these doses in the end? I want to calculate the dose. I will start adjusting my machine or device to a specific milliamper and certain parameters, and I want to see how much of this dose will reach this phantom, which represents the patient. He told you that through this equation, the CTDI index is the total of the CTDI in the center, dose, which I will obtain using the ionization chamber, plus the total of the peripheral, dose, which is at the extremities, plus the total dose in the center, giving you the weighted CTDI index. So I have now completed the weighted CTDI index. The city dose medicine is a bit complicated. Doctor, am I done? No, you haven't finished yet. Here, a new factor comes into play. What is this factor? This factor is the movement of the table. I'm not just taking one section. If I take my scan while the table is moving quickly, I have adjusted my KV and my milliampere. So I have adjusted my KV and my milliampere, and I started calculating my doses and I got this result from the equation. Now let's introduce a new factor. If I take my scan while the table is moving at a high speed, the dose that will reach the phantom will be the same as the dose if I were moving slowly, right? No, logic says otherwise. If it's moving very fast, the dose that will reach will be less than if it were moving slowly. So, what do I call this table movement? I call it the pitch factor. This pitch means the movement of the table which is called table distance movement. The table moves in a rotational manner. We can say that we have a tube and a detector and they rotate around the patient's body 360 degrees. During this rotation, a slide is taken, capturing one section. The table moves and depending on whether the movement is fast or slow, I refer to this as the pitch factor based on the rotation time. If I include this pitch in the equation, I will divide the weighted city dose index that I calculated here by this pitch factor, which will give me something called the city dose index volume. The city dose index volume is another very important term, and you will start to see it appearing on any CT scanner. Now, let's look at a very nice example. If I use low pitch, meaning the table movement is very minimal, and here I used high pitch, you can see that the dose here in low pitch is more concentrated. The dose is very high, so the absorption is high resulting in a higher dose. In the second example, the dose is less concentrated, so the dose is lower. Does the speed of the table matter? Yes, it definitely matters. The pitch factor is very important as it affects the patient dose, the milliampere increases the patient dose, and the pitch factor, the lower its value, means my table movement is slow. The dose that reaches the patient will be higher. So, I have taken into account the speed of the table which will be a significant factor in the patient's dose. As for the pitch factor, I set it in the device while I am working with it, adjusting it according to the type of examination and whether I have a child, an overweight patient, or a thin patient, depending on the patient and the region I am imaging. I am imaging something that requires high resolution or something that needs a lower resolution. The pitch factor is very, very important 
as it influences the dose and also affects the quality of the image. Now let's talk about CDI volume. So what dose have I calculated with CDI volume? I calculated the dose for this slice. I calculated the dose for the section. I calculated the dose for one slice for a specific volume. But I have 20, 30 slices in a certain lens with a specific length in a certain population lens. So I need to multiply the CTDI volume by something called the scan length to give us something called the dose lens product. Yes. You calculated the CTDI volume for one slice, but if you took a scan of 20 simiti, 30 simimitis, or 40 simiti, the dose will differ. It will definitely differ, so a new factor must be introduced, which is the scan lens. You calculated something called the dose lens product. After calculating the dose lens product, the last thing I want to do is calculate the patient's dose. The effective dose is always what you want to calculate, so how much is your effective dose in millisieverts? The effective dose is related to tissue sensitivity and is associated with weighting factors. For example, the chest examination and the brain examination might both receive the same dose, but the sensitivity of the brain to radiation is different from that of the chest or the pelvis. I need to multiply the value of the dose by the conversion factors. If the target is 23, the conversion factor for the head would be 20. From the CTDI volume of 54 and DLB of 17 and the effective dose of 15 and dose lens product of 19, when I multiply the conversion factor by the DLB, it gives the dose that the patient received. If the dose the patient received is good, then it is acceptable. First thing I want to do is, I got my phantom and started calculating the CDI weighted. Alright, after calculating the CDI weighted using this equation, I began to calculate the CDI volume, where I will include the pitch factor which is the table movement. I calculated the CDI volume and then continued from there. What should I do? I am currently working on the lens, considering how much the population length is, so I have introduced a new factor, which is the lens of the population length itself. I will calculate something called the dose lens product, which is the DLB. So what is my goal? My goal is to derive the effective dose. The effective dose is related to tissue sensitivity. When you change the scan to the chest, abdomen, or pelvis, or brain, each has a specific sensitivity and there is a certain factor for each. This factor will be multiplied by the DLB. If someone tells you that I performed chest, abdomen, and pelvis scans together and all three receive the same dose, you take the factor for all three, sum them up, and divide by three to calculate the dose. You multiply the DLB by the value you get from summing the three factors and dividing by three, you do the same for the chest and so on and you calculate the dose that you multiply by the DLB. Here you have two DLBs when the DLB shows you one for all three together. You feel the dose, it affects your eye. So what do you think will impact this dose? We talked about KV, milliampere and pitch which are crucial parameters in imaging technology. These parameters led us to discuss the detailed calculations of the dose itself, which is essential for ensuring patient safety and image quality. The tube rotation, which is an equation of the available pitch, determines how much distance will be covered during the rotation time. This is a critical factor in imaging as it affects the resolution and clarity of the images produced. Therefore, I need to consider the rotation time as a significant factor. Because if my rotation time is too short, it may not allow for adequate image capture leading to potential diagnostic errors. Conversely, if the rotation time is too long, it could result in unnecessary exposure to radiation, which is not ideal for patient safety. Balancing these factors is key to optimizing imaging procedures. Let me give you the example of the rotation time while I am speaking 